And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple, coming to us straight from Little Knight Games, not to be confused with Noble Knight Games, that's a whole other, that's a whole other topic, and, cre and creators of the upcoming Metroid Metroidvania tribute in the form of Mira, Legend of the Jinns. I apologize if I mispronounced that. We in the in the blue in the blue corner we have one of the writers, the man known as Evan, and in the red corners we have one of the producers, better known as better known as Oliver. And if I, and if I were more inebriated, I would do this it I would do this in a Michael Buffer impression, but I am not, <laughs> at least not yet. How you, how you guys doing tonight? Pretty, okay. Yeah, I'm doing pretty pretty well. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. It's um, it's not win it's not winter yet, but I know it's coming. Yeah, creeping up there for sure. In Canada, uh, and the winters <laughs> we're talking like minus fifty degrees Celsius some days here. Um, I'm in Minnesota, so it's, so I'm not. Yeah, far you away. guys get cold over there too, don't you? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, what part of Canada? Since I've got I've got friends in different provinces. The Minnesota of Canada, probably Saskatchewan is where I'm from. Oh, you're oh you're you're a, you're a ways off then. <laughs> no, it's not the Minnesota of of Canada. No, we get all kinds of because the states have so many so much diversity between the different states and what they're known for. And in Canada, we've only got like ten provinces and uh, a handful of territories. So it's like sometimes you hear like Alberta is the Texas of Canada, but you also hear the Alabama, Arkansas, and Florida of Canada. You know, like you get that a lot. So where's yeah. Minnesota at? Uh, how would you how would you compare it? Um, I, I was about to say I thought Minnesota was part of Canada. Uh, <laughs> you're the funny thing is you're not exactly far off because. The capital is the capital is Saint Paul. Um, the capital was almost named Pig's Eye after a um, after a famous French Canadian explore, explorer ar around that time. Oh. That that was it, that was his nickname. So, call, it so calling it Canada calling it um, Canada South isn't uh, isn't that out of the ordinary. Plus, I don't know whenever whenever I don't know for whatever reason um, hearing Canadians with a with a thick Quebecois accent, sounds a little bit too much like so, like um like some Minnesotans I know with a very with a very oh, yeah. thick um Minnesotan accent. <laughs> um, Fargo. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the Midwest sounds like Canada to me when I watch TV and movies set there. But yeah, but yeah, um, Far Fargo is that is the movie that everyone br everyone brings up because beca because of that, and and I'm sitting there yeah. going, nope. That's really nobody. Prefers... You don't sound like you don't you don't have that that sort of like folksy Fargo accent. You, just for what it's worth, you have you have to go for. I'm I'm in the tw I'm in the Twin Cities area for that kind of accent. You got to get closer to um to Duluth or God help you International Falls. But nobody goes to International Falls. <laughs> That's for... over my head, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I don't know the International Falls is the closest town I can think of. That's that's close to the border. It's also really okay, fucking okay. cold, even by Minnesota standards. Right. Well, you guys fuck with cold, though, there. Like, there's some states where, like, you know, you talk to people, like, North Carolina is not even a bad example. I don't think it gets too cold there, does it, Oliver? No. Oh, yeah. yeah, so you talk to some people from certain states, and, like, they've never really known winter. And I feel like I'm talking to Lannisters. <laughs> Right, snow doesn't stay on the ground here during the winter. <laughs> oh man, we don't. You know where I live? It's so dry that there's the snow isn't even the problem. Um, it's it's the it's the dry cold. It's like you go outside and right, your uh, eyelids are freezing and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we've had uh, explosions downtown. Uh, for lack of a better word, they weren't crazy explosions. We've had little explosions that like tore up uh, asphalt and stuff because of frozen pipes getting backed up. And like every year, there's like trucks that have to like brave the cold and fix pipes. Yeah, for, um, frozen right, pipes is here. frozen pipes are nothing to scoff at because no, it's, it's it's for this it's for the same reason that a, that an easy way to um to murder someone's freezer is to throw is to um throw Pepsi cans in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, which same I idea. I may or may not have done, but I don't want to I don't want to incriminate myself. Done it with beer bottles before frozen beer bottles exploded in the freezer. Um, there what. There was there was one in there was one instance I remember where um a buddy of mine was 
uh, was um get was bringing in groceries, and um he he forgot that he left a twenty four pack of Mountain Dew in in his car, and this was in January, <laughs> and um. I come, I come to see him, and I, and I see just nothing but green on the ins, on the inside of his car, nothing but green slush on the inside of his car, and I'm like, what the hell happened? <laughs> he, he for, he forgot, he forgot about the dew, and it, and it, and it would, and it just sat in there. <laughs> Gee. And it, and, and it was, and around this time it was, I think, ten below um, Fahrenheit, which. Um, I, which after I heard about that, I was like, "Congratulations, you get the fucking idiot award for the week." <laughs> I cannot translate Fahrenheit. I try, I try. I can do miles. I can do feet. It's negative. And... It's cold. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. It must be super cold, right? Because for us, when it's like cold here, it's like forty Fahrenheit or something like that. Some stupid <laughs> number. Well, once it get once it gets yeah, once freezing it gets that zero low, degree. Once it gets that low, um. <laughs> Is so it... freezing thirty-two degrees. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just saying th freezing is thirty-two degrees in Fahrenheit. So yeah, yeah basically okay. anything that's negative, uh, and that's zero degrees in Celsius. So anything that's negative Fahrenheit is going to be really, really cold uh, compared to Celsius. That makes sense. Um, but, uh, for um, t um, eleven below. That's that's about um twenty four Celsius. Round it up. Min minus twenty four, I should say. Jeez, I you, I know you guys are hoping that I'm gonna remember this, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's one of those weird things. Like I'm pretty good at certain kinds of like trivia or remembering like measuring systems and things like that. But for whatever reason, I I I break on Fahrenheit every time. Like I, I can't. Don't, I don't pay it. To, I don't pay much attention to um. To the to the hard to the hard numbers personally, it's a case it's a case of it's either not cold, cold, or fucking cold. Yeah, lick your finger and 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 put it up in the air and just see how. <laughs> for sure. Oh, well, um, I think the I think when there was that when there was that um really nasty winter storm that hit Texas earlier this year, yeah. um, I've I've got I've got my fair share of friends across the across the pond um and a bunch of a bunch of them because. Of the fact that that made national news, had had called me asking if I was if I was all right or or hey monk are you de are you dead yet? And I'm like dude dude that was in Texas. I'm in Minnesota. I I'm usually I'm usually the I'm usually the person I'm usually the person who's laughing at everybody complaining about the cold down there. Like I'll I'll hear I'll hear stories about them about some of my friends down south complaining about um complaining about forty degree weather. I'm like are you trying to get me to laugh at you? I don't get it because like i imagine i mean i've been some hot places i've been to thailand that's the hottest place i've ever been and it was like walking around in like physical heat you know and after a little while you get used to it well mo i guess most people probably do but i don't know if everyone does i got used to it but like it was uh it was brutal the first couple of days and i and i know there's parts of the states that are hot like that all the time and i'm just like holy how do people live in places like that i, I bet you north carolina has parts of, of north carolina that are like that right mm -hmm. well i mean i, I was gonna say but, like it really you know, is I, I understand that, like, you know, like, a couple of inches of snow is, like, it's nothing for where y'all are at, but, like, whenever you're, whenever you've got mountains, because I used to live in the mountains, I don't mm -hmm. currently, but in the mountains of North Carolina, and we, we, like, we only have, like, two snow scrapers or something like that for, like, all of West, all of the mountain area of, of you know, Western North Carolina, and, you know, people live remotely up on the mountain, and, like, they get snowed in, like, two inches of snow on those roads it makes it so like they can't do anything basically so it really does you know shut stuff down even the, and like yeah you know, i mean it, i i get it you know it, my only point is that there is a way in which like the same amount of snow that y'all have routinely like completely shuts down a place like western north carolina whenever we it only snows like that like two twice you know twice a year or something like that yeah a lot of canadians laugh at that like uh we have parts of canada too like um on the border and out in the maritimes where they'll they'll have snow days and they'll shut things down when they get too cold more more the cold than the snow but uh i, I try not to do i try not to laugh at them because it's kind of like i wish we would shut stuff down here um, there's this kind of like, and I think we even talked about this before, Oliver, but there's like this insane pride here about like weathering the like insane cold. Right. right and, yeah. uh, and it's bizarre because people die every year of exposure from cold, totally preventable deaths. And it's not like, it's not a crazy amount or anything like that. So it's not like, um, 
it's not like anybody's like campaigning to get to get stuff shut down or anything like that but it's it is like one of those things where i'm just like you know it's minus 50 today it's colder than the surface of mars we shouldn't go to school or go to work today like come on <laughs> you know but they they do it all here oh okay. nothing shuts down over weather ever yeah i, I know there's been there was the meme when i was there was the running gag when i was growing up of 10 10 inches 10 inches of snow on the ground schools be like two hour delay <laughs> wow <laughs> um, yeah yeah definitely there's definitely places like that hey yeah, yeah i mean th that's how it was i did live in chicago actually whenever i was like in third grade which is i think whenever i, I talked to evan about uh, about that you know dynamic it's basically like whenever i lived there we'd have a bunch of snow and we'd still go to school like 12 inches and we had like one snow day a year and that's whenever it snowed like you know so so much but then i moved here and, and like in north carolina we had 16 snow days the first year that i moved here but like i saw snow like two times but like every time that it like even potentially snowed you know they were they were shutting down school so it, yeah it's just it's just funny how how that works how, I don't, how that different i don't i only i only do i only do the picking on because um because some because some friends will pick on me about about how haha you're up there freezing and it's night and it's nice and cozy down here <laughs> Right, yeah, so, that does happen. So when so when the opposite happens, you bet I'm gonna rub <laughs> salt in those wounds. I'm picky as fuck though. I I hate it too cold. I hate it too hot. Like <laughs> oh, so you're gold. Oh, so you're Goldilocks. <laughs> oh, I like a Goldilocks. I hear it's in in Saskatoon where I live. It's it's either too hot or too cold all the time. It, you know, there's never uh, you get mild weather for like maybe you know a couple of weeks on each side of summer and and that's it. We barely have spring. We barely have fall here. Whenever Last, somebody like, plays word association me with with Saskatoon. Saskatoon, I always say, oh, yeah, the place that the Blues all, will almost moved to. Oh, yeah, I remember, I remember that. I remember people getting all excited about that, and that never happened. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. It's, a fo it's football town uh, over here. I don't know if there will ever be, like, a like a real hockey team here. Um, the, the, the clamor for it died down uh, a little bit. I mean, we got a pretty good – we got a couple of – like, we got a good college team and stuff, and we got a lacrosse team now. And, and it was really weird when that happened because – it went from like lacrosse being an East Coast thing, or not an East Coast necessarily, but Eastern thing, like Ontario, Quebec, to all of a sudden there's like this huge. It was like out of nowhere, like like a flash mob lacrosse team that was like professional in our city with people with season tickets out of nowhere, and all of a sudden you're hearing, "Have you gone to see the rush yet? Have you gone to see?" The, you know, I'm just like, "What are you talking about?" And they're like, "Well, there's a lacrosse team in Saskatoon now," and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> like what? And it took a while to get used to that, but I still haven't been to a game. Professional Although lacrosse. I, yeah, I like lacrosse, but I haven't been to a to a game yet i um the main sports fanatics here though like like saskatchewan is is it's like people bleed green here and all that with the, the main the um the main rule the main rule there are two main rules that i've always had when it comes when it comes to the jokes i can make with with um canada one mm -hmm. is um i save all my weed jokes for any t any time i'm dealing with bc <laughs> not and, anymore it's all legal up here everywhere and um well well I do it because BC Bud is it has its own, has its own Wikipedia page. That's true. That's still where all the that's where all the MOMs and the growth ops and stuff are anyway. Like it's where all the good stuff is. So I can I can see it. And Sorry, um, go on. everybody not from Toronto hates Toronto. Accurate. <laughs> it's like I can I either, I either hear it I either hear it is because of Leafs fans, which are my personal whipping boy and will be for another fifty years, I'd imagine, or because Toronto thinks that they're Canada's version of New York. They play New York on TV, but you know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> yeah. Tor Toronto is the closest thing we're, we're ever going to have to to a New York City. But I've been to New York City, and I haven't been to Toronto. So what does that tell you? Um, congratulations! You bet to the rudest city in America. There's only one. The... There's only yeah. Actually, I can I can corroborate that. We went to an, a restaurant, and uh, and I mean, up here it's like people are in your shit like compared to europe people are in your shit in north america immediately when you go into a restaurant and the servers will not leave you alone but this particular place we went to we were there for like 45 minutes and the, the they saw us they came to us over and over again and then just leave they'd be like oh we'll come back we're, and they weren't busy or nothing it was the weirdest thing and i was sort of like are we too underdressed or like what's the what's the deal mm -hmm. and we just got up and left and had steak somewhere else yeah but That's weird. Um, getting their, their loss getting to getting to saner matters um, <laughs> sure. we, we kind of, we kind of got, we kind of got off the rails, um, yeah. which is a rarity because usually, I, usually I only go off the rails on Sundays. Um, so when it, when it comes to, how did, um, how did the Motley, the Motley crew of folks that make up, 
um, that make up Little Night Games really get really get started. Ah, uh, you want the origin story? Yeah, I okay. want I want the issue zero. All right. Um, well, it goes back, I guess, probably three years ago, technically. Maybe even the idea of it was was before that, but I mean, it really started off as is nothing more than just an idea of me wanting to make a video game with with a, a friend of mine who um wa also wanted and, and 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 we wanted or basically offered me you know a way to like help me make a video game um and so we we decided we were going to make one and then we got started and realized it was way more difficult than we realized and that kept on happening over and over again um after several like false starts trials and errors i uh met up with uh Hyblitz, uh rashid um is his name his screen name is Hyblitz. i, I was Hyblitz, but i met up with him uh i found him he's the current game developer of uh mira and we started working together and he was he was by far the the best person that i'd um found to work with basically on on making a game because he's he's quite talented and he can do just all kinds of things. He um, he can he, he can do artwork. He can do animation. He can do uh, development itself. He can do game design and level design. Um, and <laughs> he can even uh, do writing kind of badly, but <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, but <laughs> uh, but still, no, he's 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 great. And so I started working with him. Uh, and we made, we started working on a game called Zeternia, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were working on RPG Maker originally. And they, the makers of uh, RPG Maker actually came out with a new system called, uh, Pixel Game Maker. Uh, and they made a competition, uh, to uh, b basically for, uh, indie developers to make games, make a game on, uh, their engine. Uh, and so, uh, Hybrids, uh, Rashid, uh, Rashid and I um, decided to basically jump ship from the project we were working on and create a new project for the just for the game, uh, just for the game uh, Pixel Game Maker competition. Uh, and and um, Hybrids' friend Shurgath, who had actually also been working with uh, even at that time, um, as he's an artist. Uh, primarily, and uh, he came up with the sort of the original idea, sort of the kernel of uh, the 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 story to to make Mira out of, which was basically an old Moroccan uh, folk tale. Uh, that uh, and that was that serves as sort of the foundation of the story. And then uh, Hyblitz, you know, basically had the idea of of making it into a, a Metroidvania um, because we thought it was going to be. Uh, <laughs> easier and a smaller scope uh, to do but it turns out that the scope has uh, expanded <laughs> pretty yes. significantly so it's it's definitely not ending up to being quite as simple as we thought it would be but uh nevertheless you know the metroidvania is what we decided was what we landed on we ended up being a finalist in that competition with Super pixel game maker we did not end up winning it we were one of the 10 announced finalists of, of like the you know, like 50 or 60 entries that there were and so we started working on uh, uh, Mira, or we really honestly got started, is when, whenever we started really picking up was after the competition had ended. Um, that's whenever we, we got together a, a bigger team. We, we added people like Evan, for instance. Uh, he's, um, I guess it's been about really probably about a year, maybe. A year, yeah. Yeah, maybe almost on the dot since. Uh, Just about. Evan... It was right at the end of August that I wrote that spec draft for the outline for you. Um, when I first when we first onboarded, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Evan's been on the team for a while now. Uh, Brian, the musician's been on the team for a while now. Leo is, as well. He he's our pixel artist. We have a a concept artist and we also have a pixel artist named Leo. Who does uh, our, a lot of our, our sprites and, and the backgrounds for our game? He's he's also been on the team. Honestly, he's been on the team for a long time too. Um, pretty close to the beginning as well. Uh, maybe not maybe not quite the beginning. Maybe 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 a little bit uh, closer to. Uh, oh, oh, looks like Evan <laughs> dropped down. But anyway, so Leo's been on the team for for a while as well, and that's mm -hmm. basically where where uh, where we are. Now that's that's kind of our core team at this point. 
Um, so that's how we got here. I don't, I don't know what happened to Evan. I, I think that he may be uh, his, his phone or connection or something like that went out. Uh, hopefully he, he'll get back with us soon. But uh, anyway, yeah, I've, so that's I've the pulled, gist of it. I've pulled filibusters before. But... Um... <laughs> Yeah, that's was fine. It, we'll, we'll just we'll just talk until he gets back. Yeah. Um was it always was it always the plan for it to be a me, a um Metroidvania or as some I know some I know some I know some pundits and the like are, and some journalists are trying to claim that the genre is called search action, but no, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's it's a friggin' duck. <laughs> and Metroidvania is the name uh, that's going to stick. Yeah, yes. I would say yes, Mira was so like I mean it's sort of, I would maybe even say yes and no, just in the sense that, like, the game that uh, Hybots and I were working on before was not a Metroidvania, and that was kind of, you know, I mean, of course, there was a game even before that. I was working on a 3D game before that that, you know, just ended up being way too much, so, you know, I gave up with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and we moved on to more like a top-down sort of Zelda-like. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that was you know, what, but I wouldn't say that that is what Miro was was supposed to be because that is it was a totally different game and it's a game that we might someday still make again you know if Miro does well or something like that i mean it's a project that could be you know picked back up so i i would say that Mira itself uh the game that we've been working on it's always you know supposed to be uh supposed supposed to have been a uh a metroidvania from its very inception yeah. Um, I mean, the, you know, Shergath came up with an idea of the story, and he didn't necessarily have a game type to go along with it, but he came up with the idea of the story, and then we just, you know, decided on Metroidvania being the, 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 you know, the model that we would go with, uh, mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the genre that we would put that story through, basically. Yeah. And I remember playing through the de- through the demo, and one of the, f- I'd say one of the first things that that um struck out to that struck out to me was in the for lack of a better word the speed of things um especially since the the idea of a metroidvania with even a combo system and hey he's he's back oh, <laughs> oh, he's yeah back. completely crashed and apparently it, there's outages happening everywhere right now so okay this yeah discord's got connection problems this twitter, twitter's on fire with people asking them what's going on um <laughs> sorry about that i don't know if we're going to lose connection again though we might. Well, um, well, imp- well, improvise throughout. Um, Sounds good. What did I miss? Um, not not a whole lot. I was built. I was building up to to the to to the question of the um, speed the um, sp- the ki- the kind of speed that that borders on a char- that borders on a character action game when it came to the combat I saw in the um, demo for uh, Mira. And I'm cu- I'm curious how I'm curious the story behind. That was it. Just a reaction to uh, to um, the way other Metroidvanias play. So hmm. why did we go with the speed of it? Yeah, that's that's kind of a tough one for me to answer. Maybe you too, Evan, because High well, was really run the it one. by me again. What's the yeah. run? Run the question by me again. I might be able to help. I talk uh, to High Blitz with the game gameplay all the time. So what struck what struck me is what struck me with um with it, with Mira compared to other Metroidvanias right. that I've de- that I've delved into is having a is having a combo system having a having a sense of speed um I, I gotcha yeah I think I think the main reason why we wanted to do that um like why it's uh like most of those kinds of decisions and those kinds of gameplay uh uh features I guess is the word they get they rise out of just like um Rashid experimenting with things and and mostly trying stuff out from games that he likes so th- there's a devil may cry influence there big time oh yeah um and uh and I and I think he just like wanted to make it so that the players had a lot of creative freedom um in terms of how they wanted to use abilities and stuff so we didn't want it to be like um your standard metroidvania where you know you hit your attack button you have some abilities that you maybe use or some spells like if you think about something really boilerplate like chasm which is a great game but it's as simple as they come Mm -hmm. when it comes to like hearkening back to the original castlevania uh kind of approach to things it's very much like a like a symphony of the night type game our game i guess um rashid wanted to update that a little bit try to try to see what else we could learn from other types of games that aren't metroidvanias uh to incorporate into into mira and one of those things turned out to be these these kind of fast fluid combos um the kind of things that a lot of uh, modern games do where you you know there's there's a certain amount of, of finesse required for how you use the buttons like mm-hmm. have you played the demo uh Mildred? yeah 
that okay so you've only really gotten to play with the one element mm -hmm. um but ideally uh, there's going to be four. Like when, when the player is playing, they're going to use all four. They're going to use the celestial element. That's the one that's in the demo, uh, a fire one, um, and the inferno element or infernal element. There's the celestial element, which is, uh, air and water. And then there's a, uh, uh, kind of like, uh, the lunar element, which is like shadow and, and, um, illusion. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing, hopefully what we want is the player is going to be fluidly switching between all those combos through, through the way that we're setting up the controller. And then they'll be able to sort of like, you'll have one player who's going to like, um, switch really quickly in between two favorites, maybe that they like to use all the time. Like I typically like heavy hitting, uh, slow kind of stuff in games like this. So I'll, I'll probably end up using the infernal, uh, mode a lot, you know, when I'm playing, uh, but other people might use all four or they might stick to mostly one. And we're trying to, to, to make it so all that's viable. Mm -hmm. And does that Rashid would be the best person to, to, <laughs> to go into this, yeah. but does that kind of, does that answer the question kind of? Yeah. And Good. since you since you brought up the, since you brought up those four um, primal elements, sure. um, the way the way you the way you ended up describing it, what um what some what somewhat comes to mind is the is the stylings for say the um well style system that was introduced in Devil May Cry three, um, right in the in that in that kind of in that kind of regard, I'd like to. I'd like to go through those fo those four primal elements and what sort of play styles they would um, fa they would favor. Okay, they they have uh, combat and non combat uh, applications mm -hmm. too. So I can, if you want, I can I can explain that a little bit too. Yeah, um, I'll start so with um, solar. Yeah, solar. Right, I was calling it celestial. My bad. Um, solar is uh, where like you. It's kind of your 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 starting one, and you're gonna have that one as your kind of backbone through most of the game. It's the the sword element. So your artifact. Uh, that's your weapon. Each uh, element has an artifact associated with it, and those are the weapons. We have um, a sword, a kind of uh, double bladed glaive, two daggers, and a chain axe. Kind of something. Kind of like um, if you took one of Kratos's uh, chaos blades and made it really big mm -hmm. and just had one of them. That's what our our uh, our axe is like. Our our, our infernal axe. So um, the kind of sword play is going to be more quick. It's going to be medium damage. The abilities are going to be mostly about healing and defense and uh, and probably a bit of traversal. So for instance, our air dash comes out of the the solar um the solar field or solar uh <laughs> the solar mode i'm gonna end up like saying the like 18 different terms that mean the same thing um bad habit so that's that's kind of how that one is used um I'm, I'm thinking that we're gonna probably end up tweaking that one and redefining it the most uh in reaction to the other ones and what they do well like for instance i think a lot of players are going to expect the uh the celestial mode the air and water one to have your air dash and i'm not sure if we're putting an air dash in there i think that that's going to be where our water traversal abilities are, are going to find their home mm -hmm. um next one do you what do you have a preferred order <laughs> you um, want to go I'm in go i'm going i'm going by the order that that i'm looking at on the kickstarter page oh right on okay i should look at that too so it's solar celestial infernal and lunar Okay, so with Celestial, um, we're we're looking at uh, at that being kind of the the light and breezy one. So there's going to be juggling, uh, a little bit more juggling with that because you use the glaive to kind of create like a like a cyclone. There are some gifts and things where there's there's no these these modes aren't available in a playable version of the game yet. But um, Rashid experiments with them quite often and has done some gifts and and things like that with them. Are those on the Kickstarter still, uh, or were yeah, they added to that? Now, when, when you say when you say glaive, are you t are you talking like are you talking like a spear, or are you talk are you talking something? Well, the glaive is a funny. It's a you're you're like a tact or a tabletop RPG guy, right? So yeah. So you probably know that glaive is kind of a funny. It ends up getting used to describe two bladed swords a lot, even though uh you know historically a glaive is 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 a pole arm. Mm -hmm. Um, our glaive is a double, basically a double headed sword. Yeah. Or a double headed spear. Yeah. The. Par that was that was my get that was my guess the I'd say the big I'd say the big reason for that the big reason that I ask is I've seen um I've seen I've seen gla I've seen glaive be used to re to use to reference multiple multiple types of things and you ever seen crawl the the 80s film where it's yeah. a it's a throwing star the glaive is a is a ninja star in that movie there is there's also the fact that um bla blades two two bladed um th two bladed thro um throwing star is referred to as is referred to as a gla is referred to as a glaive um throughout so so it right it's, and um of course if you want to get if you want to go full ridiculous there's the five blades that were used in these in the signature weapon in crawl which right 
Sure, which, yeah, it's um, five. That's right. It's got five on it. Which, fun fact on that, that was almost D&D the movie. Right, I've heard that. That's a great film. It's it's uh, it's, well, it's, uh, been, it's better than the D and D movie we actually got. <laughs> I have a soft spot for that movie. I, I Jeremy Irons hamming it up. <laughs> that the only person I, I think you could out ham him is um, it <laughs> is um Brian Blessed. Oh yes, and that's not Indeed. and that's because he is not Brian Blessed is not a ham. He is the he is the whole he is the whole roast beast. Yeah. Um. Flash Gordon. That's my my Brian Blessed. Yeah. That's my preferred. <laughs> so back to the, the the weapons and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, the fun stuff, right? So so uh, the the celestial one is going to have to do with um, jumping around a lot. That's going to be a, a very mobile mode. Mm-hmm. Um, that's sort of it's like it's a niche, I guess, or niche, I should say. Yeah. And then uh, what's after that one? Um, um, infernal. Infernal. So yeah, I, I did uh, refer to this earlier, but it's the heavy hitting one. So like the Infernal is like your big chain axe. It's a little bit slower of a weapon. It hits a bit harder. A lot of those abilities are going to be AOE, like hitting the ground, a bunch of fire and, and, and rocks come up, you know, and do damage in that area. Abilities like that. Um, for traversal out of combat, um, we have a Lava Crab. Oh yes, it's my favorite thing in the game. I always I bring it up every chance I get. Um, so it, your traversal ability uh, in in that uh, mode is to get across spiked floors. Essentially, any floor that's like um, dangerous that you don't want to walk across. Well, Yuba can summon a lava crab when you have the ability unlocked, and that crab shows up and you ride on it. It's a moving platform essentially. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions that I do have about Infernal, given given that it's the he- given that it's the heavy and the um. All the allusions we've made to DMC up up until this point. Um, one, would that be the only one whose um, whose attacks can be charged? Actually, I'm not sure about that. That would be a Rashid question. I don't even know if we're going to do charging it, charge attacks in every mode or not. Yeah. Um, I, w- I would expect so. Um, that would be something pretty boilerplate, right? Like. Uh, you'd expect to to kind of have your heavy attack um, mode have like something where you hold the button down and, and it gets heavier. So I, I I imagine we'll have that. Yeah, I'm, I'm when I'm when I'm bringing that kind of thing up, I'm I'm um, drawing upon the ch- the charge attacks that say um, the if say a lot of the gauntlet weapons have in in the yep. Devil May Cry series. Um, yep. And the other the other question, and this this might get this might be a little bit terminology he- heavy on the on this front, but would that be the only one that has whose attack animations have super armor? If you're familiar with that term. Are you no, but are you thinking of infinite uh uh what's the word? Um iframes like immunity frames or invulnerability frames? Is um, that what you mean? No, su- with super armor you're not if super armor is a term that's that um originates in fighting games. Um okay. what it basically means is that you're still taking damage but the animation isn't interrupted. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so. There's a shield in that in that uh, in that mode that I believe works that way. All right. And yeah, um, like you you kind of hold it up and and you can take some some damage for a while and you're and you're still you know you're not like interrupted, mm-hmm. um, but eventually you run you run out of mana and then you're gonna drop your shield. Yeah. Um. And the the last one of the four is um lunar. Yeah, lunar sort of um your fast daggers, but it's also got a little bit of stealth gameplay associated with it. So we're not we're not really doing a full stealth mode, but there are going to be abilities in the lunar um uh tree that feel like that a little bit, like being able to disappear and reappear behind an enemy for like a backstab. Um lunar is also the traversal ability that that uh right now we have associated with that mode is to phase through solid obstacles. Mm-hmm. So there's certain solid obstacles. I think there's a gif of it on the Discord or sorry the Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. And that has like a kind of purple symbol um on a wall and that tells you to use your lunar mode, right? We use a lot of color um a lot of color uh uh cues for the player to kind of like know what to use and, and how to do that. And something we actually talked about quite a bit early on uh, when we started to design the abilities, it's a big conversation uh, I had with, with Rashid and the art team over several months was about color theory and how we were going to figure out which colors to use for which things. And even our characters are defined or can be defined by particular colors associated with what element they belong to. Cause we have a whole cast of, uh, of Jin characters that, that basically function like party members in an RPG. They're with, once you recruit them, they're with you all the time, mm-hmm. but they don't, um, they don't like come in, into combat and help you out directly. They give you powers because you're kind of carrying them around in your head. They're like, uh, you're not possessed, but something like that. And so, Stance. you know, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, you get <laughs> you get like your mode going, and that's that particular Jin's power kind of in your in in Yuba that that Yuba's manifesting as an Azahar, mm -hmm. which is a, a Amazir word for basically wizard. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody that can like merge with a Jin or or whatever we call it binding, mm -hmm. uh, and use magic as a result, that's that's an Azahar, and, and Yuba is the first one in a long time in our story. Mm -hmm. um, he's got that kind of like bringing back the old magic sort of sort of trope going on. And um, each of the jins has a color that they're associated with. So Mira, the, the probably the main character really, like Yuba's the protagonist, and Mira's the protagonist as well, but um, Mira's really who the story's about in a lot of ways, especially the second half of it. Mm -hmm. um, and her color is yellow. So her text is in yellow. There's a lot of yellow associated with her, and that's also the color of the solar mode, which is her sort of bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the jins are split. Um, each mode has two associated with them. Because you got your fire gen Arkea, you got your air gen Aisha, you got your water gen Samui, you got your earth gen Homer. Uh, I think uh, our, our Moroccan friends pronounce Homer a little less Simpsons-y, but uh, same difference. It's Homar or Homer. Mm -hmm. And those guys all split sort of, like when you when you recruit them, you sp they split the, the mode amongst themselves because the modes sort of represent two elements at the same time. Um, in some cases, not in Solar's case. Solar is a special exception. Um, now, now, when it comes to when it comes, maybe I maybe I maybe I missed it, but did you mention the um, you mentioned that Sol solar is solar's artifact is the sword, um, celestial is the um, glaive is the glaive. Um, I think you mentioned infernal would be the axe. An axe, yeah. And I don't unless I mistook it, I don't think you mentioned what um lunar would be. It's double daggers. Yeah, so a really quick, uh, close range, you know, like you got to get close to the enemies, risk some punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's going to be one where like the players like kind of hand-eye coordination is going to matter a lot. Yeah, I got, I got Being you. Being able to avoid damage while dishing it out with daggers. I mean, you know, dagger gameplay in games like this is, is pretty much always like your, your fast and dirty kind of kind of uh, style, I guess. Speedy boy. Mm -hmm. Um now, and that... we're not. We're all, there's a lot of speed built into all of the modes. Like, like I'd say that uh, even even the the celestial mode is pretty fast. Um, but it's matters of degrees, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So by far the fastest I think is going to be the daggers. Yeah. Um. Now, when it com now when it comes to when it comes to upgrading weapons, is um when the, when applying weapon cores to to a get to a given weapon, is it would it mainly just increase damage or are there other effects with um, upgrading weapons. Right now, I believe it's just damage, mm -hmm. um, but we're we're not like it's not locked in yet. If we if we're playing through it or we're we're messing with it, really, it's going to be Rashid who kind of like he'll kind of at one point he might come to us during a meeting or something and he'll say, you know what, I was messing with the weapon cores and I was messing with weapon damage and just upgrading the damage seems kind of boring. So what if we did this? And it'll be something like that um, if we do expand on that. But there are actually lots of progression um, streams in the game. So I'm not sure if, if that will happen or not. I can't make any promises that it's going to be more complex than just a damage bonus. Yeah. Um, now, the other, th the other thing that I, ha that I happen to find interesting that you're doing is bringing in a skill tree, which is definitely right. not something that you see that you see in the um, inspirations for this kind of thing. Oh. I think... Blasphemous might have been one of our our main inspirations for for doing a skill tree at all. Ours was a little bit more expansive, I think, than uh, than than Blasphemous is. Blasphemous well, uh, well is. Obvious, obviously, because <laughs> Blasphemous only you you only were using one sword, and right, and, yeah, and they and weren't associated with with different weapons. Exactly, yeah. We we have a little bit more complexity, um, I would say for sure. Oh. Yeah, Blasphemous was a pretty like all of us. I think not all of us played it, but uh, but more of us played it than than not. I think so. It was kind of one of the one of the touchstones we used a lot when I first came on because Blasphemous was still relatively new uh, a year ago, and uh, we we enough of us had kind of played it that we could use it as a as a touchstone to kind of refer to, right? Yeah, the I'd say I'd say the only the only other um, Metroidvania that that I current that I currently have in my library that's that's out that um had that had that kind of thing. Is um, and this and this ba this barely counts, um, the messenger. Oh yeah, okay. Although um, I'd I'd say the, I'd say the messenger has more in common with Ninja Gaiden's bullshit than it does with um any Metroidvania. <laughs> yeah, um, 
Yeah. I mean, uh, we're hoping that, that it feels, it doesn't feel superfluous and that it feels like a, a core part of, of the game to have these, these different, cause we want, like we wanted to, um, update like most Metroidvanias, you know, like you find stuff and then you kind of unlock it. Some have uh, Symphony of the Night style RPG mechanics where you can like, you have an inventory, you have stats, you can, you can look at your, uh, at your, uh, at your numbers kind of, and you can change your equipment and, and do all that kind of stuff. And, and we simplified some things like that. There's not a lot of items in our game. Like there's, you're not going to be finding like 13, 14 different weapons through RNG and then kind of juggling through them until you find one you like, or get the powerful version of it or whatever. Um, but in other ways we've expanded things. So less itemization, but more, uh, progression, mm. more like, um, mechanics based progression. Yeah. Um, and because because of because of that, would it be fair of me to say that um, since you mentioned inventory management, that's not going to be as much of a fa of a factor the way it is in some of, in other approaches? Right. Where there's there's right now there's probably maybe two dozen items that we're planning uh, in the game, and most of them are consumables. Um, there's there's going to be a little bit of like. Um, you know, kind of quest items that are in your inventory that don't really do anything. They'll have some flavor text, but they're really for a quest. There'll be a bit of that, but there won't be a lot of like juggling an inventory, equipping things. There's no armor in the game, things like that. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all of that progression comes out of our skill tree and out of our uh, other progression mechanics that some, some of which like, you know, uh, unlocking an ability when you find the right room, very classic Metroidvania stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm I'm guess I'm guessing that I'm guessing that in that regard you want you want to try and because as much as as much as we may love Symphony of the Night and the like, um, in the in a fa in a fair amount of the kit that you could have in those kind of games there was a lot of um, fluff, a lot of filler. <laughs> um, like, do you mean like in terms of challenges to kind of like what kind of fluff? Because like I'm thinking. Of um, three different things in that I'm game thinking, that I, I could define I'm that way. I'm thinking of stuff. I'm thinking of equipment and the uh, and the like yeah. that um get that got that got significantly overshadowed. Um, well, I mean, who who has fun watching a streamer manage an inventory, right? Like, it's one of the things that we we especially Rashid thought a lot about was was how would streamers and speedrunners approach our game, and uh, it's probably one of our selling features that we're intentionally keeping that in mind. Like we're not building the game for speedrunners exactly, but we're keeping them in mind. We're keeping streaming in mind. We're keeping um, ways of of getting out of the player's way in mind. And, and one of those uh, things that affects me more uh, is dialogue and how we're going to do dialogue. Initially, we were going to do text box, um, like you know, portraits, cutscenes, all that stuff. And we're still doing that in some cases. But uh, more more of our dialogue is now going to be like you saw in the demo. Um, it's going to pop up and you're still going to be able to move around and it's going to be like a little box on the screen without a portrait. It's not going to stop the gameplay. It's going to kind of sit there with you. Um, and, and you'll be able to move around or, or whatever you want to do as a player while you're doing that. And it's not, we're, we're going to try not to interrupt the player too much or take too much time away from just being in the game. We don't want them to spend too much time in a menu system or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's kind of different than, than a lot of Metroidvania has been on all of them. Um, and we're all JRPG guys too, so it's sort of funny that it turned out that way. Um, I've some something that, something that I've noticed is that is that um, a lot of people a lot of people design with a wide net, and then and then as time goes on, you you go with a smaller and smaller net. And if that seems like too much of a fishing reference, I remind you where I come from. <laughs> are you thinking? Uh, are you thinking in terms of like who you're making the game for, or how much like scope, like how much game there is, like like what do you? Like the, like the like the pro the proper um the proper dire the proper direction and and then just pairing just um filing off anything that isn't it isn't adding or take or isn't adding oh, yeah. to it or is ta or is taken away from it. Totally, yeah, and I mean we we kind of like like uh, Oliver was saying we started smaller and have kind of built up scope over time, um and that scope that we've built up is is less like I don't know I would say it's less like new big gameplay features and more just like 
well, how big are our levels going to be and how long are they going to take to beat? And how much story is there going to be in the game that you're going to actually see and, and experience firsthand versus how much of it's under the water if you're thinking of icebergs, right? Mm -hmm. There's that whole, every, every good narrative should be like an iceberg. There's all the stuff that you have direct access to that you can see and then there's the stuff going on underneath it. Um, there's all the things that we know about the world and that we know about the characters that the player might not necessarily ever see. Um, so we try, we try to keep that in mind right from the beginning. Uh, we don't, we don't have, we haven't had a, a point yet, um, where we've had to really cut scope, although we might have to eventually, um, like, and, and the, the form that would take would be maybe making some of our levels a bit smaller when I'm writing, um, uh, narrative. And when I do level design, because I do the first conceptual pass at our level design, I'm the author of the level design document. Um, and Rashid does all the, 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 I don't know if he would say it's the fun stuff I would, but he'd probably say what I do is the fun stuff. Um, but he does the building, right? So we start with the document and then he builds it. And, uh, and when I'm doing that, I build in places to cut scope, like just from the, on a conceptual level. Like for instance, if we are going to have, um, how many mini boss fights are we going to have for instance, right? Like, so, uh, that's organized in a way where we could, we could say at the beginning of our planning, we're going to have five mini boss fights in this level. But it's, it's set up in such a way that we don't actually need to have that. They're not pivotal enough that if we had to cut down to three or two, we can't. Mm -hmm. We try to do it as much as possible. And I mean, I don't want to imply that like we're, we're, we're half baking features or ideas so that we can cut and run if we need to. It's not really like that. It's more like anything that, that doesn't need to be like set in stone right now. We try to keep in mind the fact that we might have to cut it. Yeah. Now, in a lot of, in a lot of Metro, in, in a fair amount of Metroidvanias, they tend, they tend to focus on, on one particular, on one particular area. Whereas the world that you have has a, at least from the at least from the um, world map image that's shown on the page, has a right. lot of um a lot of variety when it comes to when it, com when it comes to different when it comes to different potential biomes, not just um right. not just desert ruins. Um, right. With that kind well, of thing, desert you... ruins in our game, <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. There there are something like eight uh, biomes, mm -hmm. I would say. Oh. And there's subdivisions in some of them too. Yeah. And I'm get and this is pro this is probably going to be the obvious question, but I'm get but when it but I'm guessing that you're going to be doing a portal based approach when it comes to fast traveling between between biomes or between areas. Oliver, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't know if we've actually set that in stone yet. How we're going to do fast travel? There there's some there's some talk about doing a kind of like um like a like a mount that not that you would ride, but although that's a cool thing that some Metroidvanias are doing now, um, but more like a station for lack of a better word, yeah. in Siri Village that will, where you have a camel or a, or a cart or something, and that takes you, you can use that as a fast traveling system, but I'm not sure where we're at with that. Yeah, we've talked about some different things. I think we've talked about doing different, like, statues, potentially, right. as fast travels. So yeah. I, I don't think that we've, we've honestly finally decided on how we're going to fast travel. There will be some... We did know that, you know, there will be some backtracking where you'll have to go back yes. to previous locations but yeah how exactly that will look is still a bit up in the air at this point. And one of the things to consider is that the desert ocean part of our map connects to pretty much everything else even the, the map that you can see on the on the kickstarter and our website it's like a you know it's the artist version of our of our world map right so the way that everything fits together um is typically through the kind of side scrolling grid map stuff that every metroidvania has mm -hmm. um and the desert ocean in that case is the hub or the crossroads for all of these areas so um we're hoping that if you're not going to fast travel you can go to the desert ocean you can pretty quickly get to wherever it is you're going although there are places like adrar's peak that you have to go through at least the first time you have to go through the forest to get there you have to climb up a giant tree that's two biomes right there mm -hmm. and then uh and then you get up there right and so we, we need to have some kind of fast traveling we just don't know how we're going to execute it yet yeah now with with that with that kind of thing in mind um obviously obviously one of the other major th one of the other major motifs in a metroidvania is um is the is the items that you're specifically going to be using um, for pure uh, traver for pure traversal. Yeah. You've mentioned yep. um you mentioned seven of them that you're go that you're going to be having. I believe one I believe um if I, as I recall one of them is one of them what one of them was the was the pick that you're going to be using for wa for um walls. Um, right. What can you tell me about some of, about some of the others? 
there is the main one. Our, our, the pick is the one that everybody sees and uses because it's in the demo and it, and it has uh, two purposes. You can smack rocks with it and it's used for mining, which is fun, right? We try to do as much dual purposing with elements as we can. The other thing is, like you said, the, the wall climbing. Um, there's a Gambry tool that is available in the demo, but it doesn't really do anything yet. That tool is going to be, um, you're actually going to be able to whip it out and play it whenever you want. And, uh, and we'll use a timed button press system for that, that we actually, I think Rashid just, just finished up uh, a draft of that system. That, um, that but, timed button press, I'm getting um, Ocarina of Time flashbacks. Something like that. Uh, probably a little bit less, um, well, I'm not actually sure. It might be less or more complex. I don't exactly know what, what, that's gonna, what shape that's going to take, but it's going to be a little bit like that. And you can, you can play it when you want, but there's also other purposes that it serves. There's a there's a major story event, so the Gambry features pretty heavily. There's puzzles that it's used to, uh, for. There's a combat purpose for it. We have these, um, we're planning these, uh, these optional narrative um, uh, uh, scenes that are associated with certain areas. So there's going to be an area in, in most maps where the player can kind of stop and smell the roses and you'll and, and Yuba will stop there and play a song and then a cutscene sort of it, it'll probably take the form of um the kind of pause the gameplay and have the cutscene kind of thing um a conversation will occur between the characters um the jins and and yuba and usually we'll we'll use that to add some lore about the world or let the characters bounce off of each other a little bit. If you think about Bioware games and how they tend to have like a kind of a banter sort of system, it's a little bit like that, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit more gated, a little bit more uh, structured than, than it is in a Bioware game where it's open world most of the time. So you're kind of just, it's occurring whenever um, ours is a little bit more directed than that. Uh, but that's one of the things that'll be, it'll be available to the player to kind of sit down, play the Gambry and talk to their, their companions if they want. Not everybody's going to be interested in doing that, so it's going to be an optional uh, bit of narrative in there that I'm going to have a whole lot of fun writing because I love writing dialogue. Yeah, and, um, and the, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, the Gam the Gambry it's, itself this is going to be a, is going to be an instrument that I think for a lot of people playing this is going to be is going to be their first time seeing one. Yeah, um, from, totally. From what, I, from what I understand of it, it would be it would be somewhat it would be somewhat analogous to a um to a to a loot. Yep. Yep, that's probably the closest. Um, it's a string instrument, so sitars, uh, hamisons, uh, or shamisons, I should say, uh, guitars, and uh, lutes are all, you know, in the same wheelhouse. But I think that I've heard it compared most to a lute. Yeah. Um, at the at the very at the very least, it's nice to have one. It's nice to have one played that's played by someone who isn't a bard for once. Well, Yuba is kind of a bard because <laughs> of the because of the of the. Uh, I mean, he's a jack of all trades, you know. So he's got a bit of bard uh, energy. He really does. Even at the writing level, he's a bit of a. Oh, he's uh, he certainly is. I just, I just like, yeah. I just like, um, I just like picking on bards because of experiences with um, D and D bards over the years. Naturally, naturally, <laughs> easy target, definitely. Um, had those same experiences. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so so Yuba's got a, a musical instrument. That's one of the tools. Those those are probably the two that the players are going to use the most, just because they're the most um, the earliest introduced. Mm -hmm. But there are others. There's a tool that is used. It's kind of like a um, uh, an incense censure, and it's used for unlocking like kind of. Uh, uh, I think that's the one that uh, you're, you're you're testing my memory here. Um, it's been a while since so I looked at our our, our tool list, mm -hmm. but there is one, uh, and I believe it's this one, where you um, you use it and it. Uh, opens up like hidden platforms so you'll use the item and these platforms will appear for you um there's another one that is uh well we have bombs i should mention that mm. at least right now i think we're going to do bombs um that's another tool that's a that's a classic right at one point we were talking about throwing daggers uh but i'm not sure if we're actually going to do that or if we're going to use um, the mode system to have a projectile attack because there already is a projectile attack in the game um that you can get uh in the demo have you got, I don't know if everybody unlocks it or if it's, I can't remember if it's a, if it's an automatic, like you always get it if you find it or if you have to buy it through the skill tree, but there is a, no, it's, you have to get it to progress. So it's like, a, yeah. do you remember it? It's like you, you, it's like a Zelda thing where you shoot your sword, your sword shoots a, yeah, sword. a beam out kind of thing, mm -hmm. or I guess it's more like a wave. Um, so, so we might do that instead of, instead of using item daggers. I'm not sure where Rashid's at on that. Um, but, but we do have seven tools that'll all have different, uh, uses for, for traversal. I probably have, I have it written down somewhere. Where the heck? I didn't, uh, I didn't open up my docs for this. I should have. But yeah, there's, um, we're trying to, to not do like, you know, not overkill it. So, um, 
I'm sure if there's any redundancies, we'll probably end up peeling one back. But right now, there are seven planned. Mm -hmm. And where is that stupid file? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, don't don't it? Jeez, don't I know that feeling? Mm -hmm. Um, but with 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 all with all of that in mind, um, what would you say? What would you say have been some of the big takeaways that you guys have learned from the uh, from the reception of the demo? Uh, art was uh, was very popular. Like uh, the yeah, art style that sure. that uh, Leo and Shergat developed for the game is uh, definitely stood out to people. Yeah, that was a. a and I think. Oh, sorry, Oliver. Go ahead. I said a lot of positive. We got a lot of positive feedback. Yeah, and we got a lot of really good feedback in general about the mechanics. And Rashid is really quick to respond to a lot of that in terms of like making changes to the game. Um, we have we have some pretty like. Like we have a couple of users or our community members or whatever word we're using for them, but we got some guys in our in our in our circle who uh, are quite good at describing in granular terms gameplay mechanics, um, almost like they do some dev themselves. I'm not sure, but they, they maybe do. And so feedback from them about mechanics, but there was a lot of a lot of people were just impressed because it felt like they were maybe expecting less. Some people have been along for the ride since the very early version of the game um, that existed before I came on. We had a completely different art style. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's a lot. It was a lot different and a little bit more primitive, I think, um, compared to what we have now. And uh, and there was a lot of people that were pretty impressed by how like the combat worked, how fluid it felt, how professional. We heard that a lot um, that it felt, and that was all nice to hear. Yeah, people are happy about the length demo too. Like yes, it seems yeah. like we have a pretty, a, a fairly length demo compared to uh, at least some solid of hour for most players. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not even the whole level. Like that level is probably going to be two hours and change in the end. It's got one boss fight, which is uh, I don't I don't know if that's the main boss fight for the. I don't think it's the the main boss for the whole level. But that boss, uh, I think that Rashid killed it with that. Some of the enemy design needed some work when we released the demo, and I think some of it's been been uh, addressed by now. But the boss was the one thing when I played the boss uh, and I did that fight, I knew we had something for sure. Like I mean, I knew before that, but like it felt like we had something instead of just like looking like we had something or reading like we had something, right? Mm -hmm. um, that boss fight, uh, uh, like I would argue, is is a very well designed Souls like style fight. Mm -hmm. It's got phases. It's got it. It punishes you for over relying on abilities that you were using probably to kind of cheese combat a little bit before that, you know. So if you're if you're using the air dash too much or in that boss fight, he's gonna fuck you up. Mm -hmm. um, it, the boss fight has a it has a gimmick that shield thing and, and drawing attention to the shield, but that's not really what you want to be. It's a, it's a pretty good boss fight. I beat it my third try and it had that feeling of like each time I died, I learned something. And that was uh, really important to me. Like uh, I think Rashid nailed that and that was all him. Yeah. Now with, with that, in, with all that in mind, um, what would you guys be shooting for as far as a, as far as a release window for the uh, project? That's a good question, a fair question. I'm, I'm actually working on, on a document right now with, with some various sort of time horizons, depending on how funding, you know, turns out. Right now, we're, we're talking to uh, some publishers, potentially about them helping us out, uh, you know, to get the game made. Um, but we haven't, you know, signed the dotted line on anything. So kind of a worst case scenario which is that we don't get any other sort of external funding or support or anything like that. Um, and we just have the amount that we got from the Kickstarter that we recently did, which, which uh, we were able to get like uh, about 20, after Kickstarter's fees, about 22,000, mm -hmm. whatever, um, thousand. So with that budget and, uh, you know, like I said, no, no further support. We're we're looking at, you know, kind of the the far end, which what we what we declared for the Kickstarter was was April of twenty. I think we just said actually just twenty twenty four. So right. you know, spring. That, yeah, spring, spring, yeah. spring twenty twenty four. That's that's kind of our, and I, and I would say that that is you know that is as far back as as we really you know like to release it. You know, I. Well, I I'd certainly like to release it sooner. Um, I'd certainly like to release it by like 2023 or something like that, but that remains to be seen. I, I'm still working on on some of that, um, you know, the documents for for 
like the various final scenarios but at the very least um we're going to shoot for uh yeah april 24 uh, mm-hmm. spring 20 uh, all right now i will certainly be keeping a close eye on the on the development um as it as it goes um but with with all that said i do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zone juggling as well as um technical <laughs> difficulty juggling yeah yeah sorry about that again i don't know what the hell happened no um the the um we all one of one of the mantras we have here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy yeah fickle mm-hmm. um and of of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it whether it's to whether it's to further delve into Mira to or to post about other um of other met, other Metroidvanias or just or just Metroidvanias as a whole, um, least of which being the fairy familiar being useless, <laughs> um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Cool. Thank Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks having for having us. us. Yeah. And and if anybody wants to, you know, see our our various social medias or anything like that, just go to mirrorthelegendofthegins dot com. That's our main website. I think that we still have some Kickstarter stuff up on there. I'm gonna take that down here soon, but we'll we'll still have, you know, everything linked like our, our like Twitter, our Instagram, our Facebook, our YouTube. All of that stuff's just mm-hmm. on that website. So if anybody wants to find out more, just head on. Over. Definitely yeah. join our Discord. There's quite a few people there. It's it's uh the, the time zone thing makes it a little it, when it's busy, it's hit or miss. <laughs> like it, it could be any time. Um, but there's quite a few people there now, and it's uh it's a nice space, and we're definitely open to having more people in our Discord for sure. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>